everybody, and welcome to Dr. Archer's Lectures. When we were together the last time, we were finishing up talking about elasticity, and we ended that discussion with talk about total revenue. You remember total revenue. Total revenue is how many you sold times the price you sold them for. Quantity times price. Quantity times price. It's just that simple. And total revenue tells us how much money we took in for a given period. If I'm selling lemonade and I'm selling them for a dollar a piece and I sell 10 of them, quantity 10, price a dollar, my total revenue is $10. But even when we were looking at that, and we were looking at that as it related to price elasticity, there was a piece missing there. Total revenue is all the money that you take in, but somehow you got to pay the bills. You've got expenses that have to come out of that. The owner of the business does not get to keep everything that they take in. So in this session, we're going to begin to look at costs. And we're going to begin to look at profit, which is total revenue minus total costs. Profit is total revenue minus total costs. Total revenue, again, is the amount that the firm receives from the sale of its output, price times quantity. Total cost is the market value of the inputs that the firm uses to produce that output. To produce that output, it's never free. Remember those uh, factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, they always have to be paid for, and those are always necessary to get any kind of output. Costs come in two flavors, if you will, two very distinct categories. There are explicit costs and implicit costs. Explicit costs require an outlay of money. I always talk about that these are the things that you would have to write a check for. So they include paying your wages to your workers, paying your rent, paying your utilities, paying the suppliers for your raw materials, everything that you have to pay for directly, anything that you would write a check for. These are all explicit costs. In accounting, these are the costs. But in economics, we look broader. In economics, we consider best use of available resources, and that requires that we look at some implicit costs. Implicit costs, let's look at this example. $100,000 to start your business. The interest rate is 5%. So you borrow the $100,000, so you have to pay $5,000 interest on that loan, 5% of $100,000. That's an explicit cost. You're going to have to write a check for that. In case number two, you use $40,000 of your savings and only borrow $60,000. Now your explicit costs are only $3,000, right? Ooh, we got off much cheaper, much cheaper. But what about that $40,000? If you had left it in the bank, wouldn't it have earned some interest? That's your implicit cost. That's your opportunity cost, what you missed out on by the decision that you made. You lost out on the $2,000 interest that your $40,000 would have earned if you had left it in the bank. In both cases, total costs, explicit costs plus implicit costs, are $5,000. But accounting costs looks only at the explicit costs. Accounting focuses on tracking money, money in, money out, cash flow. It is about tracking the money. Accounting profit is total revenue minus total explicit costs. But economic profit costs includes both the explicit and the implicit costs. And economic profit is just the relationship between the quantity of inputs used to produce a good and the quantity of output of that good. So what does it take to produce it and how many can I produce? That relationship. 
And so it can be represented by a table, it can be represented by an equation, or it can be represented by a graph, and we're going to look at all of them. Example number one, Farmer Jack grows wheat. He has five acres of land, and he can hire as many workers as he wants. So here's his production function. We're going to look first at his inputs, which is his laborers. His labor is one of the factors of production, as you'll recall. That's your input. How many people do I have to have on this land to produce this wheat? And then your output is the wheat that your work crew produces. What can they produce? So the production function is set up like this. You have the quantity of output on the vertical axis. And the input runs along the horizontal axis. So if we don't have any workers, we don't get any wheat. So our input is 0, and our output is 0. And you get us the vertical axis up to 1,000. And then we're going to go over on the horizontal axis to one worker and where those two intersect that's your first data point if that's going well let's hire another worker two workers we get 1800 bushels of wheat again 1800 bushels of wheat so we go straight up the vertical axis to 1800 and then we go across to two workers and where those two intersect that's our second data point wouldn't you think that if one worker could produce a thousand bushels that two workers should be able to produce two thousand didn't happen did it i think you'll see a trend developing here let's see what happens when we have three workers we add another worker and this time we only got 2,400 bushels total for the three workers. So to graph that, you go straight up the vertical axis to 2,400, straight across the horizontal to three, where those two intersect. That's your next data point. But look at this. Our first worker gave us an increase of 1,000 bushels. Our second worker gave an increase of 18 of 800 bushels, not a thousand, 800. And our third bushel, a third worker gave us an increase of only 600 bushels. Hmm, 100. What's going on here? When we increase to five workers, we only go up by 200 bushels of wheat. What is this about? This is our Farmer Jack's production function. And it has that characteristic bend because every time we add a worker, it increases our output by a smaller and smaller amount. So the slope is not constant. It's actually decreasing. But why is that so? Let's think about this. This is called marginal product. That's what we're thinking about here. Increase in output from one additional unit of input if you hold everything else the same. So it's calculated by change, and this little triangle here indicates change, change in quantity divided by change in labor. And this gives you marginal product of labor, MPL. Marginal product of labor is change in quantity divided by change in labor. 400, change in labor is always 1. So we've got marginal product of labor of 400. And finally, when we go from 4 to 5, change in quantity is 200. Change in labor is 1. So our marginal product of labor is 200. That change in our marginal product of labor, that decreasing marginal product of labor,
That's what gives us that curve in this production function because the slope is not constant. It's changing 1,000, 800, 600, 400, 200. And the marginal product of labor is diminishing as labor increases. So your curve is going to get more and more flat. Big change with the first laborer, not so big a change with the fifth. Each time we get less and less additional output for each laborer that we add. This is the diminishing marginal product or diminishing product of labor. Diminishing product of labor diminishes as labor rises, whether the fixed input is land or capital, and the diminishing marginal product of an input declines as the quantity of the input increases, all else equal. So the more labor you put into it, the less you're going to get out. Farmer Jack's output rises by a smaller and smaller amount for each additional worker. Why? When Farmer Jack hires an extra worker, his costs rise by the wage he pays the worker. His output rises by marginal product of labor. But comparing them helps Jack decide whether he should hire that worker. And that's the discussion of marginal product of labor. Essentially, for each worker that you hire, you're going to get less and less and less output. And yet the price for hiring that additional worker is probably going to be the same. The wage is probably the same for all your workers. So it's important to consider both of those costs as you look at whether or not you should hire an additional laborer. Is the next worker going to be able to produce enough to offset the cost of his wages? Why do workers produce less and less as more of them come on board? They have less and less capital to work with. Think about it. Farmer Jack only has five acres. With one laborer, that one guy could use all five acres. By the time you got five people in there, each one of them could only use one acre of land. And if you tried to put 25 of them in there, it would get even smaller. Each worker would only be able to, produce, to use one-fifth of an acre of land. And so those, those resources, those capital resources, are harder and harder to come by. Workers are crowded. Workers don't have enough equipment, enough resources. It gets harder and harder for them to produce at the same level. And that's why you see marginal product of labor decreasing. It's expected, and it's okay as long as the output will sell for more than the cost of having the worker to produce it. And that's the consideration. So we'll see you next time for more discussion on production costs and how they work. Thanks for being with us for Dr. Archer's lectures.